fill to capacity, where heart, grit, and irreverent humor collide. A podcast for people too stubborn to quit and too creative not to make a difference. Hi, I'm Pat Benincasa, and welcome to Fill to Capacity. Episode number 78, Dementia and the Long Goodbye, Care and Coping. Today, we are joined by a passionate advocate in the field of senior care and dementia, Jennifer Awinda. She also is known by her pen name, Empress Ivory and is a prolific author, illustrator, senior living executive, and dementia practitioner. She's an end-of-life doula, public speaker, and the founder of Timeless Doula Services. With an array of books, animations, and training tools to her name, her newest publication, Navigating Senior Care, Dementia and Dying serves as a vital handbook for the final chapters of life. Jen's mission is clear, to alleviate confusion and provide dignity, resources, and guidance for those navigating the complexities of senior care and end-of-life transition. Moreover, Jen has written engaging and insightful books about dementia for children and teens, helping young minds understand and cope with this challenging condition. Well, with all that said, welcome, Jennifer. So nice to have you here. Thank you so much for inviting me. So before we jump in, I just want to say to my listeners uh, that Filter Capacity covers a wide range of topics that impacts people's lives. Dementia is one that is important to me as it affects people that I love. And I know I'm not alone. I hope you find this conversation to be useful. So with that said, Jennifer, I'm really curious. What is your backstory? What drew you to this topic and made you so passionate and creative about it? All right. Well, I have been a writer since I was a young girl. Three out of four of my grandparents had different diseases that caused dementia. So after my grandmother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease um, and my grandfather was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, that's when I started working in senior living. And then another grandmother was diagnosed with vascular disease, which then, you know, developed into dementia like the other grandparents of mine. My fourth grandparent, uh, my grandpa Bruce, he actually lived to 98 and he was clear as a bell until the last day. Yeah, but that's really what got me into working in senior living and my passion is definitely for caring for aging people and working with people who have dementia and since I, you know, work with so many people who were actively dying or who have transitioned, it's important that people understand this is part of life. I mean, dementia is not normal aging, right? But dying is part of life. So whether you have dementia or not, it's good to know your options, which is why I wrote that book, Navigating Senior Care, Dementia and Dying, so people can know their options. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to ask you about this misconception that as people age, they get what's called senile dementia, as if that's a given, And I'm so glad you're addressing that, that that is not a natural outcome of aging. It's not. Dementia typically starts with mild cognitive impairment and then leads into severe cognitive decline. But that is not normal aging. Normal aging is living well into your 70s, 80s, 90s, even 100s now and still remembering and recognizing your family and your friends and remembering what you did yesterday and having well-rounded conversation or whatever, you know, was going on. It's not normal to develop 
senility or cognitive impairments. Those things are not normal. That's okay. Sweet. Yeah, that's not normal aging. Now, before we go any further, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? So I like to use this analogy. There is cancer, right? Well, there's so many different kinds of cancer. You can have breast cancer, colon cancer, brain cancer, bone cancer, so many different kinds of cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Well, dementia is the same way. There are so many different things that can cause dementia. Alzheimer's disease causes dementia. Parkinson's disease can cause dementia. Vascular disease or severe enough stroke can cause dementia. Being hit in the head with a baseball bat can cause dementia, right? So dementia is the umbrella term for the symptoms of that progressive brain failure. And so when it's diagnosed as dementia, it has gotten so severe that the person cannot take care of themselves, cannot handle their day-to-day. -day. That's when it can be diagnosed as dementia. But there's a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease that don't have dementia yet. There's a lot of people with vascular disease that haven't developed dementia yet. So once it gets so bad, and it's progressively getting worse, that is your dementia. Okay. That's a, a nice way of distinguishing between the two. I want to talk about caregivers. Watching a loved one gradually lose their memory, personality, and independence has to be just so incredibly painful. How can caregivers cope with the deep sense of grief and loss they often feel? I like to recommend people to support groups. They're very helpful, you know, especially when you're able to bounce ideas off and situations off of other people who are going through the same things that you're going through. You don't feel quite as alone. Yeah. So support groups are very helpful. Um, making sure that you have a support system in place because, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's all me. I have to do everything for my mom or whatever, right? But we, we do have good Samaritans in this world, and we overlook that fact. Even your neighbor might be willing to once a week make a little extra food if you give her a little extra cash, yeah. you know, for one meal to help with that meal planning. Because trying to do everything for your loved one, it can be draining. Oh, yeah. Another thing is making sure that you have your own mental health. You can't be that up 24 hours a day person and try and take a nap when they're taking a nap because you're not really sleeping. You're, you're um, not eating. You're not doing yeah. you're doing social relationships or suffering your personal identity, giving up yourself because you're trying to do everything for your loved one. What we tend to see is the well spouse decline even faster than the ill spouse because they're not doing that self-care. Yeah. So taking time for yourself. There are assisted livings that have respite services, short-term stays. If that person is already on hospice, then hospice, there's a five-day respite and patient stay covered by Medicare. And, you know, there's different options, even having someone, I hate to say babysit, but watch your loved one for a couple hours, just so you can go to the grocery store or having a private caregiving company send a caregiver just for a couple of hours so you can do some of those things that you need to do. But having a support system is extremely helpful. Going to those support groups, it's very helpful. I'd like to ask, there's a point as a caregiver, you're managing, trying to manage the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, like agitation, aggression, wandering. Is there a point when you're caring for a loved one that it becomes too much that if this person requires 24 seven, you know, you have to watch them so they don't leave the house or wander off or is getting very aggressive. How do people know that point? Cause I, I imagine people want to say, no, no, I can handle this. At what point do they stop and say, I can't do this anymore. So everyone's breaking point is different. It's relative. Some people they're able to keep their loved one at home the entire time through the end of life. But when there is wandering, it makes it challenging. When there's those aggressive behaviors, sometimes you need professional help. And what, what we see a lot, again, is that ill spouse waiting until the last moment 
to place their loved one and they're so worn out. Sometimes we end up we end up visiting the well spouse in the hospital and they're freaking out in the hospital. Who's taking care of my husband? Because they're in the hospital now. Yeah. Not. Where has he wandered off to? Right. So you need a support group. It's very important, but you also need to be realistic and let go of that idea. And I hate to say this, I'm not trying to sell a community or anything like that, but let go of the idea of the, you know, mid 1900s when we could have four and five generations living at home. Yeah. It's just not our reality anymore. If you're still working and trying to have your own life, it's going to be really hard to care for that 90 year old person that's now being violently combative with you. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you do need professional help. You do need hospice to get involved sometimes. Some people qualify for hospice. They have end-of-life dementia, yeah. but loved ones are in denial. Oh, no, no, they're not dying yet. Well, if they've had dementia for so many years, then yes, they are on their way out. And sometimes people do not reach out for help from hospice or from other you know, organizations until the last minute. I mean, Jen- the average... And a hospice, right? I want to ask you, do you think there's an element of feeling like you are betraying your loved one if you place them in a hospice situation? Yeah, in the hospice and in the senior living scenario. Yeah. You know, people say that they'll, I'll never move you into a nursing home. Well, assisted living is not a nursing home. Nursing homes have 24 hour nursing services. Assisted livings do not. Memory care communities don't have 24-hour medical services. It's supposed to be non-medical. They can help with bathing and things, right? But just because you are getting a hospice evaluation doesn't mean someone's going to die right now, okay? It only means that now they're going to have CNAs and nurses coming to the home more often or coming to the facility more often just to give that extra attention to loved one that had so many people go on hospice and then get booted off of hospice. They no longer qualified because they were doing so much better. They were eating better. They were, they had comfort meds in place. Yeah. So they felt better every day. Letting go of that guilt. This is human. We are all human. Yeah. You but know, all you of know, us have a time expiration stamp eventually, <laughs> right? Yes, we do. But you bring up a good point because I think there are many folks out there who are listening who are juggling multiple roles. They're parenting their own kids. They're trying to take care of aging parents. They're working. And it's this constant juggling. Yeah. And, of course, they're calling it the sandwich generation, right? Yeah. You're, help, you're raising your kids and your grandkids and taking care of your ailing parents. Yes. And you're just squeezed in because you're still working full time. You're still trying to manage your own personal personal relationships and some kind of some kind of serenity in your own life. Yes. Right? So when yes. you have that many responsibilities and then your car needs maintenance now and oh the ceiling upstairs or whatever, right? It's important that people realize we are human we all have limitations yeah. and that's why there are so many senior living communities out there who can help or uh, those in-home caregiving companies and just different resources your area agency on aging and your different alzheimer's associations and things like that that can really help and give guidance but to feel guilty for not being wonder woman or superman we're all human yes we are You know, I want to talk a moment about emotional whiplash. One minute, the loved one is lucid, knows who you are, and then in a split second, they're confused or unresponsive. It's like you lose them all over again and again and again. How do you deal with this emotional roller coaster? Moment to moment. And when you think of it, uh, you know, it's hard to not use the development of an infant. They can't tell you what they want, so they cry, right? They need things, and they have to have outbursts for you to recognize, I need something. And that's kind of what's going on with that dementia piece. Once they can no longer communicate their needs, there are behaviors. There are ways that they express themselves. Mm -hmm. which are very challenging for us to investigate, figure out what's going on. 
everyday moment to moment to trying to make that person happy in this moment because they're not going to remember 10 minutes ago anyway, right? So it's every moment making it as positive as possible, as calm and serene as possible. Okay. Keeping them occupied and stimulated. Anyone who's, any child that is bored is going to find something to get into. So the same thing with an adult, you know, if they have advanced dementia and they reverted to childhood, they need something to do. We all lived our lives, had lots of stuff to do. So to just stop because now you have dementia, it's some room for potential problems. You know, I read somewhere that with someone who has dementia, if you bring in like a box of rocks, leaves, barn wood, photographs, or play music, that sometimes the tactile handling of let's say autumn leaves give them comfort or allow them to reminisce or looking at old photos or playing music from their time growing up seems to connect them to a moment. Most definitely. And when you think of the music piece, that is so important. The other tactile things that you were referring to sound more like those organic materials. The yeah. Leaves. And now in the right temporal lobe, your rhythm is retained, your love for nature is retained. So those kind of things go together right there in the right temporal lobe. Even if you haven't spoken in months, you start singing jingle bells and you, that person with dementia might remember every single word and sing along, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even if they put a song on that you haven't heard since you were 12 years old, you haven't heard it on the radio since you were a kid, they put it on, you remember every single word of yeah. the song, sing along with it. Harmony is extremely important. It helps us to keep positive moments flowing. So yes, get that playlist ready. Some of those Songs from back in the days are going to be very helpful. Going outside, seeing the birds, feeling some nature, those are always going to help. And, you know, when you think about that nature, a lot of people have problems with sleeping. And it's because their circadian rhythms are thrown off. You know, outside, you get that natural vitamin D and that natural sunlight, you might have more problems. And so it's important that we do have that connection with outside, with nature, and not just be in the the room um, music is important. Um, the spiritual beliefs are important. Um, those things are retained. Yeah. I want to ask a question that folks might be reluctant to ask. Caregiving can bring out a full range of emotions. You know, caregivers feel so deeply committed and they want to help, but they also can experience frustration, feeling overwhelmed, isolated, angry, bitter or even ambivalent at times. Can you talk about the state of mind of caregivers as they navigate these complex emotions? I mean, first of all, is it okay to feel all these things? Whatever you're feeling is, is normal, is natural. I mean, whatever you are feeling, the same thing with you know a person, how they grieve before the person dies. All of these are natural feelings, right? And it's important that you do have a support system, though, because if you're just dealing with it all yourself and you think all the weight is all on your shoulders, yeah, that's going to cause some mental distress, and which will lead to physical ailments, right? I mean, it's yeah. already shown stress leads to disease. So the state of mind, it also depends on how much sleep you've gotten, how much support you have. If that person is going to adult daycare every day or if they're with you 24-7, yeah. right? that it just depends on each person and what they're dealing with. Yeah. And that brings me to your book, Navigating Senior Care, Dementia and Dying. It, you know, it's a comprehensive guide. Can you just give us maybe a takeaway or two that you hope readers will gain from it? Most well, definitely. There's so many takeaways, though. Really? There is there's three parts to the book. It's all about the senior care piece, your options, what you need to be looking at, planning for, things like that. Because a lot of people don't know there's private long-term care insurance that can cover the cost of senior living. There's VA aid. There's all these possible monies out there that might help to pay for care, whether it's in home or in a community. The main takeaways, though, is you will have answers 
to hundreds of questions in this book. So your takeaway is going to be those answers and therefore you can make better decisions. So, I mean, I put so much in this book. It's, it's years of compiling information, yeah. experience, and all the ins and outs of senior care. And not only that, then the second part in that dementia, this is what dementia is and isn't and how to work with people who have dementia because this is a relatively new term. Ronald Reagan that really made it a big thing, right? But he had Alzheimer's specifically. And you've got other types of dementias out there. Alzheimer's is not the only one that causes mm-hmm. dementia, right? We see Bruce Willis and Wendy Williams being diagnosed and they're in their 60s. Yeah. And there are people filtering into communities that are in their 40s and 50s. So it's important that it, this isn't a baby boomer thing or a GI generation thing. This is Gen X as well. And even Gen Z. Now you got Gen Z's being diagnosed with colon cancer and different diseases that yeah. may lead to dementia in your very young age. So the takeaway is that all of us are illness or injury away from needing that book and the answers in that book. And two, you don't have to be afraid if you have the tools and the pre-planning in place. If you know what questions to ask, you don't have to be afraid. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, when I was reading about you, I was so thrilled to see this. You've written books about dementia for children and teens. And I think that when people discuss dementia, they're so focused on the loved one that they don't think maybe about grandchildren or children or all the people that that person affects. And here you went and you're writing this for children and teenagers, this thing called dementia. So what unique challenges do young people face when a family member is diagnosed with dementia and how can these books help them? The challenges are that their parents often don't really understand it. And they're looking for answers from their parents because parents are the ones that teach us as children, right? So when your parent doesn't know about why their mother or grandparent is going, what they're really going through and how we can help to some degree, it's important that the little kids, since they're impressionable, that they understand. I started writing books when I was nine years old. I remember how over, you know, zealous I was about writing. I just loved it. So I realized a lot of my friends, they, around that same age, that 10, those pre-teen, they were like, I know what I want to do when I grow up, right? We're all looking for what we love and they are impressionable. They're also going to be the, the caregivers, okay? And they're also going to be caring for their parents who unfortunately, since dementia is about to increase by 200%, Dementia is about to increase so significantly, they're going to be the neuroscientists and the neurologists, and they're going to be the ones that are potentially finding the cure. And so if we can get the young children engaged and understanding at least the basics of dementia right now, not only are they going to be able to have some type of an intergenerational activity with their loved one when they visit versus just sitting on a cell phone looking over here while grandma's way over here potentially bring them together and hopefully get not just more caregivers, but more fresh new minds coming up with ideas yeah. Yeah. on how to alleviate some of this pressure. Yeah. I want to go in a different direction. You have aging parents and how do you know they have signs of dementia? You know, like what is a normal, like, oh, I forgot my keys. Oh, they're in my coat pocket to dementia where it is significant. What are the signs that they have to see to begin to suspect maybe they have dementia? So this is going to be different for everyone. Definitely, it depends on the condition that caused it. Because again, if someone has Parkinson's disease, they may live with it for 20, 30, 40 years and develop dementia at the very end. I think around 70% of Parkinson's cases develop dementia. Not all of them do. And it's not a memory loss thing for the Parkinson's like it is for the Alzheimer's. It's easier to see that Alzheimer's one because you're like, okay, mom is repeating herself and she's forgetting things. But with the Parkinson's, 
that's a whole different, that's your, your shuffling. But there's a, a difference. Same thing with the severe stroke. I mean, someone can have a severe stroke at, at a moment's notice and then develop dementia and have not just the drooping and the slurred speech, but actually mm-hmm. not be able to handle themselves. Their cognition is totally gone so badly that it's diagnosed as dementia. So it really depends on the person. When it's a gradual progression, again, that Alzheimer's, you see the memory loss and the forgetting things that, you know, the repeating themselves and not being able to have a train of thought and an action mm. that makes sense. Follow along with everyday life with that potentially another type, let's say Huntington's disease, that is also like that Parkinson's loss of motor control or your frontal temporal disease, you're going to see not necessarily as much memory loss as you're going to see behaviors, you know, the angry outbursts and screaming and potentially lashing out and punching. So it just depends on who and what condition caused it. But definitely that cognitive decline is extremely important to watch out for. If you see someone is repeating themselves a lot, you told them three times already and they still are not grasping it, they need to have some tests run. But this is another thing. If someone has dehydration severe enough, it can cause delirium. And here you think this person has dementia, but it's actually an infection that can be treated because of a UTI or something else. So those mimic dementia symptoms, have behaviors and things that just don't the disorientation with a severe infection. So that isn't dementia, though. That is delirium that can be treated. But of course, some people with dementia also develop delirium. So... (laughs) Yeah. If you notice there's a decline in cognition, you need to see a doctor, have tests run and have them potentially diagnose the problem. What I so appreciate about your approach is that the nuances that everybody is different. It could be a medical condition. It could be dehydration, all these components. So you don't have to jump the gun saying, oh, dementia, but maybe I want to take my parent to a doctor and just get a checkup and see what's going on because you're really presenting a strong case. It could be a variety of things. Yeah. You know, as we were talking about support, I came across the Alzheimer's Association. They have a 24 seven helpline and the number is 1-800-272-3900. And they also have on their site, a link to community support in your area. And I'll put this in the show notes, but folks need to really know that there's a place to go to and reach out for help. And you've really stressed that, Jen. Alzheimer is referred to as the long goodbye. And it's that prolonged period of gradual decline. God, that can go on for many years from diagnosis to death. Now, during this time, Caregivers and family members witnessed the slow loss of memory, cognitive abilities, and personality traits of their loved ones. This gradual deterioration often leads to a sense of anticipatory grief, where a loved one feels the loss of the person they once knew well before their physical death. Will you talk about anticipatory grief? Yeah, this is really challenging. Say you got married to a person and they develop a disease that causes dementia. They become an entirely different person than the one you married. And yes, in life, we all change. That is true. Everyone changes over the years and decades. But the dementia part of it, that's a different type of change. Okay, that can that can make a sweet little old person turn into a mean, angry, physically aggressive person, or vice versa. Someone that you were married to or your parent that was so mean all your life, and now they're just as sweet as pie. And it sure is hard to be mad at them now, right? And, mm-hmm. But you have all these decades of history and family dynamics that me as a professional in working in memory care communities, I don't know that family history 
right? All I know is what I see now, and I can only coach for what I see now and try and help people through this particular part of their goodbye. But yeah, that person that is you married them and now they're completely different. It's it's heart wrenching to see so many families going through this. But we do, to some degree, have to disconnect ourselves in order to maintain our own normality, our everyday life. Because you can't just grieve every single day and break down crying every single day because your loved one doesn't remember who you are now. You know, they can't feed themselves now and the caregiver has to feed them now. They're incontinent. All these different things that come with that dementia piece. You still need to have your own life and yes you come visit of course you know you need to yeah. you know be you need to still be there even though they have become someone else and maybe don't even acknowledge you're there maybe they're just totally staring into space and, yeah. in and all of that stuff but your presence is still very important there they they'll know your touch they'll know your voice even if you think that they're not paying attention or they can't hear I'm the same thing with that dying piece. You know, a lot of people are, when they're actively dying, sometimes it takes weeks. Yeah. Okay? They're, they're in that bed and they're emaciated and they're just drifting a little further, a little further. But you just being there to say goodbye, whether it takes weeks or whether it takes years, being there is very important. You know, I would want my family there. Yeah, of course. It's, it's rough though. And again, those support groups are going to be helpful. Learning as much as you possibly can about dementia, which is why I wrote that book and which is why the dementia piece in that book is so heavy. It has so much information because to understand when you see someone doing something weird, oh, I know what's going on. I, I know what that kind of means to some degree, seeing some of the behaviors. Okay, I know I can't argue back because they won't understand my logic because that frontal lobe is being destroyed you know just yeah. understanding where the brain failure is occurring and it's simultaneously happening in all parts of the brain to a little bit of comfort in seeing okay this person is gradually disappearing i think some of the uh, aspects of what you're talking about is suggesting that the caregiver stay in present moment stay in present moment. And the other piece is you're saying if you know what's coming down the pike, if if they're acting a certain way and you go, oh, that's that frontal lobe thing, you still feel frustrated, but knowing seems to help that, oh, this is what they're going through. Okay, I get it. Frustrating as hell, yes, but at least you know what it is. Yeah, it helps you have a bit more compassion when you understand that dementia piece, it makes it a lot easier to tolerate. Yeah. You know, as a dementia practitioner, what advice do you have for families who are just starting to navigate the complexities of dementia care for their loved ones? They're just starting it. I would definitely say, and I'm not just saying this because I wrote the book, but you need that book. People need to read this book. It has so many answers, not only about the senior care and your options and how to pay for it and what to expect and what dementia looks like and mm -hmm. how to help people with dementia, but even when it comes to that, the final transitions and what to be looking for and to how to interact with people, a hundred different things you can do with people who have cognitive impairments and the, the travel piece, even, you know, trying to get on an airplane with someone who has dementia or a long car ride to go from one state to the next. And there's a lot, a lot okay. involved. And so that my book is going to be, you know, it's, it's, I call it the handbook for the final chapters of life. Yeah, I saw that. Also, the books that you've written for children and teens, if someone wants to get your book, should they go to your website so they can look at the books for children and teens as well as this handbook? Yes, you can definitely go on my website, jenniferalinda.com. It's Jennifer with two N's. Alinda is spelled A-W-I-N-D-A, -A. so jenniferalinda.com. I'm constantly writing and putting more information on my website. So yes, I have the books about dementia for the little kids, for the teenagers, just to get straight to the point for these teens. And then, of course, more extensive information for adults. I will definitely put your website 
in the show notes so folks can reach you. Well, this has been quite a conversation, Jennifer. I, I want to thank you for sharing your important and creative work with us today. It, it was really wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us today and take care. Bye.